Go. Fontana. Perilous times are going to come to a bunch of kids and they're not going to know what to do with the storms. What's going to happen when parents start arguing? What's going to happen when you get bad grades? Perilous times will come in our lifetime. Jesus said, you know what? In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart for I have overcome the world. And one day this Mexican is going to come and he's going to preach to you this word right here from 2 Timothy chapter 3. And he tells Timothy, this is what's going on inside the church. Okay. Inside the church with Christians. This is what's happening in these last days. People are behaving a certain way. Take a look at what he's saying. Men will be lovers of themselves. They'll be all about themselves. They'll promote themselves. They'll be all about the glory of themselves. Okay? Lovers of money. Everything they do is to get rich. Get rich quick schemes everywhere. They are boasters. Which means what? They boast of everything in Christ Jesus. They are proud of what they've accomplished apart from God. Proud of everything that brings them glory and everything that diminishes the glory that's, that, that's deserving of our Lord. And they're blasphemers of the truth. Promoters of the flesh. Disobedient to parents. Purposefully disobeying the authority given to our own parents. Not caring that in their culture... By disobeying their parents, they could actually get stoned to death. It was capital punishment to disobey your parents. These people are unthankful, unholy, unloving, and forgiving. And this is, we're talking about Christians here. People that have actually received Jesus into their lives, into their hearts, that they've received forgiveness of their own sins, but yet they're not forgiving of other people. They're slanderers or mitoteros, gossip queens, gossip kings, just out there being busybodies, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty. And this is what was on the outside, okay? This is what's happening on the outside, what you can see in people's lives. But then Paul transitions into the motives behind those behaviors, what does he say? He says they're lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. They'd rather be pleased with themselves or pleased how people see them, their reputation. They'd rather see that grow than see the name of Jesus grow. Having a form of godliness, this is what I was talking about, these are Christians, because they have a form of godliness but they are denying its power. This is the root issue of humanity. Is we, we know what the scriptures are saying. We know that inside of our hearts, God has placed eternity there. So we know that the Bible is 100% truth. And so when we look at it and say, oh yeah, you know, I'm a Christian too. I love Jesus too. 
but then we don't act like it, we don't behave like it, we are denying the power of the gospel. When we are hypocrites, when we look at what the Bible says and do the complete opposite, we are denying the power of the gospel and the fact that Jesus conquered the grave. That's what we're doing. Having a form of godliness but denying its power. This is the root issue. This is what makes it worse because it's happening within the church. Paul is speaking to these people and he says, though they have this form of godliness, their behavior is denying the message of the gospel. They can't proclaim Romans 8.11, which says this, but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, okay, if you've accepted Jesus and that spirit that, that, that raised Jesus from the dead dwells within you, that's what happens when you get saved, when you, you, know, you come to the knowledge of Jesus. That's what happens naturally. A supernatural work that happens naturally in you, okay? He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. And what we're doing is when we're receiving the gospel internally, but we're not acting upon it externally, we're denying the fact that God lives in us. And we're saying, you know what? I don't believe it. We're saying, you know what? Mm, I, I kind of don't get this. We're saying, you know what, I, I really don't know if I'm truly saved. And when you have, when you question that, you begin to question truth. And when you question truth, guess what begins to happen? You begin to doubt. Paul is making it clear that these people have yet to experience a life fully resurrected from the grave of this world. Think about it this way. The world, sin, is the grave. And what Jesus does is defeats sin, death, and the world and gives you new life. They still have a form of godliness, though. That's what like, gets me. It's like, man, they're still coming to church. They still taught Christianese. They still know the right words to say. You know, they, they say, oh, I'm blessed today, brother. I'm blessed today. And sister, and this, God bless you. And, you know, they leave and they drive the speed limit right around the corner from church. And then, you know, they're always just making sure nobody sees them, you know, breaking any laws. And then they get on the freeway and then like, I'm one of those. See you later, you know. Paul encourages Timothy. He says, avoid them. Turn away from them. Now, why would, you know, I, I, I have trouble with this because to me, my ministry has been walking alongside of people who are struggling with sin. Okay? But these people have yet to accept Christ. So I guess that's okay because you're you're walking with them, you're encouraging them, you're, you're showing them how to live in Jesus' name. But if there are people who proclaim the name of Jesus and walk differently, Paul is saying here, dude, look, don't waste your time. Avoid them. If the gospel is the chief necessity and they are devaluing that gospel, they truly don't know their need. If Jesus is what they claim, Yet their lives promote something completely different. They are misrepresenting the Lord. They are misrepresenting the gospel. They are misrepresenting what Jesus did on the cross for them. And it, it, the thing is, is they're like those who Jesus called out in Matthew chapter 7. They're like those people where Jesus says, you know what? Not everyone says to me, Lord, Lord, you know, who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, look what we've done. We, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and, and done many wonders in your name? It's all about themselves, right? 
I did, I did, I didn't I do this for you? Didn't I do that over and over again? And Jesus will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Verse 6 through 9, we see that these types of people were dangerous to the Christian community because they looked, sounded, and acted just like everybody else. Yet they still denied the power. They weakened the witness of the church because of their false testimony. They would come into gullible women's houses and because these women were okay or promiscuous, they would sleep around with them. They would be all about what, what's going on in their households. And, and they would lead them astray, believing that, that one day they would still be excused of their sin that they did while still being a Christian. They presented a different gospel, one that would allow their past behavior to be mingled with the new life that Christ was offering them through this message. One of the characteristics that these types of Christians hold is that, that they were always learning, yet never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Have you ever seen or talked to anybody that has, like, literally, all their, they keep searching, and they're like, they, they come to Bible study, and they take notes and everything, and they're like, yeah, but I'm just not satisfied. Yeah, but this is not enough. And they're just like, I need more. I need to go to a different church. I need to go to another church. And I, I, I'm still searching. And they're not satisfied with the pure Bible, with the Word of God it taught verse by verse, chapter. They're not satisfied. And they go about always learning, yet never able to make a decision for Jesus. Pursuing knowledge and education, challenging the authoritative word of God and searching for something better with more insight than the Bible. And they become just like Janus and Jambres who, what they do, they made themselves equal with God. As Moses would do a miracle in Exodus chapter 7, they would mimic that miracle and they were proving to Pharaoh that they were equal to the power that, that was over Moses by the living God. Friends, I believe that the reason why people seek value elsewhere is because a cross has not been the most valuable thing in their life. Until we realize that the cross is the most valuable instrument of salvation, we're really not going to know what it took Jesus to save us. Until we realize the value of those, the whippings, the beatings that Jesus took, we're not going to realize how much he loves us. We're not going to realize how much, how, how much of that, that, that worth, that, that, that beat down took for us, for our sake. In verse 10, all the way down to verse 15, you see that. Paul is, is telling Timothy, you need to learn from the fathers of your faith. You need to learn from myself and my witness and how I've suffered. How I've just gone through it, how I've been beaten, shipwrecked three times, bitten by a viper, like stoned to death, left as good as dead. And yet I still wanted to go into that city because guess what? I had a heart for that city. And even though they beat me down, they weren't going to count me out. We must learn from those who are imitating Christ. From those who claim to be Christians both within the church and outside of the church. This is the hard part. This is why people bail is because most of us are living one way within the walls of the church, but when we leave, we're a totally different person. This is why people call us hypocrites. This is why people look at the church and they're like, man, they're not living right. 
is because we're one thing in the church and we're one thing outside the church. And Paul is trying to prevent that. We need to look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross and despised the shame. How many of us want to pick up our cross today? How many of us woke up this morning and you're like, man, I want to pick up, I want to be like Jesus. Raise your hand. How many of you? None of you? A couple of you? Good, then you need to be listening to this message. Because see, that's what our flesh wants. Our flesh doesn't want to pick up our cross. Our flesh doesn't want to serve people. Our flesh doesn't want to lay our life down as a ransom for many. Our flesh wants to be served and not come to serve. And that's the battle. That's the battle that Paul is saying, look, man, there's going to be people that are going to come in that are going to be all about themselves. And they're going to want, like, hey, I want more relish on my hot dog. I want more mayonnaise, more ketchup on my hot dog. Do you have any soda? Some of this water stuff. You know, like, that's what you're going to do. Naturally, our flesh wants to be fed. And the gospel is about coming and being humble and saying, Lord, I just want to be used by you. He's not calling you to be fake. He's calling you to surrender. He's not saying just come to church and be somebody at church and then go home and be whoever you want to be. He's saying don't be fake. Don't be a hypocrite. Just surrender your life. That's all he's saying. And you know how you're going to learn to surrender your life? is by living like the fathers of our faith who took God for his word. They didn't even need to shake hands on it. They listened to the word of the Lord and they're like, God, this is it. That's all I needed. Right? Joshua is like, he's scared to death. He's like, man, I don't know how I'm going to go into this promised land. I don't know what, what I'm going to do. And, and God's like, hey, hey, come, come down. Come down. Come. I want to show you something. I want to show you something. As I was with Moses, so I'm going to be with you. As I was with the previous dudes, that, you know, did all this crazy stuff for Jesus, my spirit is going to rest upon you in that same manner, in that same power. The same spirit that actually raised my son from the dead is actually going to be living in you. And so, I have a question for you. Is that enough for you? That God would live inside of you, that God would care so much for you, then he would say, hey, invite me in. I want to do a, a crazy work that if I were to even tell it to you, you wouldn't even believe it. How does he do this? It's through the Bible, through the Word. And that's why in verse 16, he says, hey, guess what? All Scripture is profitable for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. He's saying, hey, this is how you are going to get right. This is how you're going to walk circumspectly. This is how you're not, you're going to look at the straight and narrow and you're going to be like, yes, Lord, this is what I want for my life. Because this crooked path, this path of, of unrighteousness, of lawlessness, of the feeding the flesh, guess what? It's all about me. And I want to be like Jesus. I want to be like you, Lord. And so I want to make it all about you. So I want this straight and narrow to be my path for the rest of my life. You're only going to notice, you're only going to recognize the necessity of Jesus when you open up your Bible and you begin to discover who he is. That is what tells you how much you need the Lord. It's going to be revealed to you. You're going to discover it. You're going to go through the Gospels. You're going to be like, Lord, I don't. I need this. I need more of this. Like, can, can we start school later so I can read another two chapters? Why? Because there is nothing that can satisfy your soul than the Word of God. Nothing like honey to your lips like the Word of God. And God says, come taste and see that I'm good. 
Everything he does is good. And it's your decision. What are you going to choose today? Are you going to choose the path that leads to death? And the path that is filled with lies? And the path that leads to a courtroom where nobody knows what the truth is and everybody's trying to prove that somebody else is innocent? Or are you going to choose a path that looks at Jesus who was 100% innocent and yet was tried guilty for your sake? What do you do? Up, 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 Maybe write a book about your life with your praise. Show down the readers, man, praise you, get the praise. So they explain, tell him not to say his name. Famous, so we get them like cocaine. But the drop of cold depression turned into a hurricane. I'm a million slang, I am not the same. I speak the truth, you bastard, but I understand. When I'm on stage, I'm never fake, I am the same. From that hell is gang. So I'm a telephone. Across the world, so we can play. Broken cool. Still we fighting now has been explained. And hard to those who pick up the cross and overcame. So he remains on the right hand of the father's reign. So let me make it plain. I'm all of the father for David and Tang. Teaching his words, so they can work it. Tasting his book and breaking these chains. Not a seven second vibe, but it's proof for me. Because the truth remains within your heart. No games with the past. That is not how we play. Follow me the man. check out what we have back there but also I just want to get connected with you guys because we have a lot of free resources and things on our website so we love you guys love you guys let's give God one more hand praise my squad we way up eyes red